today. I was going to go to something else, and I'll, I'll just lay that groundwork for, for the following week because it, this is it's too great a topic to not stay on for a few minutes today. So if you want to go to Ephesians 6, you may. It's an amazing, amazing piece of Scripture. Um, let me pull it up here because I, I want to be able to... I'm going to read it out of the... Uh, out of the Passion Translation, because it's just really powerful. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Boy, did, you, did you grab that? Be supernaturally infused with strength, with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Okay, that, I mean, we could camp there and not move. Listen, we have to be in union for life with Jesus Christ because that's where you are supernaturally infused with strength through the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do it any other way. Stand victorious with the force, listen to this, with the force of His explosive power flowing in and through you. That, you stand victorious in that because it's, it's Him and Him alone. In Him we live and move and have our being. It's the explosive power of Jesus flowing in and through you. That's what happened in that chapel last Wednesday. It was the explosive power of Jesus and every one of those ladies that came together. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Okay, so it's very important for you to note that there are evil strategies being designed against every one of you. So don't, don't think it unnatural when stuff hits you. We've had so many things hit us in the last month that finally we just said, it, can it be any, I mean, another thing like this? You know, if it's not one thing, it's something else. If it's not one storm, it's another. Sometimes they stack on top of each other. But just remember, you're not going to face this in your own strength anyway. It's not you. It's Him working in you. against the evil strategies of the enemy. Okay, your hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay, <laughs> I've heard people teach before, oh, well, we have this weapon, and we'll just take the whole enemy out. Well, let me just tell you, in that process, it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's not like you're 10 miles away. You know, the battleship Missouri, when she was in her fullness of, of glory, she could shoot shells from her guns 24 miles inland and they would destroy their targets. That's how they defeated Tokyo in Japan. They, were, they weren't close, they were far and shooting shells and they brought people into submission with their, with their shelling from that distance. This is not what we're talking about. God's not saying, okay, I've set it up for you to be like a long way away, and you just lob those shells. No, what's happening is the enemy sneaks in. Now, there are moments we do that. There are moments in our intercession that we're dropping shells and taking out the enemy, and it's powerful. And there's a dominance that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit that we want to celebrate and be greatly thankful for all God's working in us, both far and near. However, Paul is talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat here, up close. We're in a conflict with the enemy, and he wants to get up close and personal with every one of us. Don't get pulled into his game. We'll catch that in just a second. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods. Okay, it's a little g, not a big g. And evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. 
And because of this, you must wear all the armor God provides so you're protected as you confront the slanderer, for you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. So put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. And put on holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. And stand on your feet alert, then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. And in every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it's able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. And take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God and pray passionately in the spirit. As you constantly intercede, that word constantly is important. With every form of prayer, okay, as you constantly intercede with every form of prayer at all times. Every form of prayer. There are times to travail. There are times you just make mention of things all through the day. There are times you pray in the Spirit. There are times when you get the revelation also and you pray that. There are times to declare. There are times to decree. There are times to just soak in His presence and release that which He's asking you in your spirit to release. There's times to meditate on His Word until it comes alive in you. I'm just telling you, there are all these manners and ways of praying and intercession. Use them all. with every form of prayer at all times, and pray the blessings of God upon all of his believers. And then Paul, I love this, he gives all this stuff and instruction, and then he says, and pray also that God's revelation would be released through me every time I preach the wonderful mystery of the hope-filled gospel. Man, I love that. I love that. I pray that over all, all of you. That you have God's revelation being released in you every time you open your mouth. Isn't that a delightful passage of Scripture? (laughs) It's important for us to realize and recognize what I was saying last week about the armor of light, that we never take it off. It's always on us. We don't ever step out of that. We, we, why does it say that he, uh, Paul says that he, he, he's thankful that he prays in the Spirit more than you all. He's talking about this very thing. He's thankful that he has the capacity and the ability as God is enabling him and the Holy Spirit is empowering him to pray in the Spirit more. And that's what he's saying to them. He's not like lording it over them and saying, oh, I pray more than you. He's saying, I'm grateful that I'm in this position And I'm trying to show you so I can help you to be led into this as I am led by Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ, he says. And so he's trying to give them an example so that they know how to put these things in place so that the armor never comes off. I have have friends and people that I'm connected to, and they are, they're, they're, some of them are praying through the armor of God again and trying to put it on again. And I just want to remind them, you should never stink and take it off. Because it's when you take it off that he's, you're vulnerable to, to him getting to you. you. Why would you take off your faith? Why would you lay down your salvation? Just saying. Why would you put the Word of God aside? Why would you unbuckle this holiness that is upon you? It's a weighty thing. Why would you lay that down? You wouldn't. you got to keep it on. That's why he not only told it in this case, in Ephesians 6, but he also went on to say that it's the armor of light. And that's the light that we talked about last week of Jesus Christ shining in us that empowers us. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit in and upon us. So let Him work. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then in the next verse, he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And then verse 16 says, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What that's saying is, look, get all this stuff in order. Cast down the imaginations, but have everything ready by all these things he's putting on you to just in your life, let that be revenge against the enemy for all the disobedience that happened prior to that. Okay, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is our example. He's seated there, not striving, not trying to put a, a victory in place. No, he's already won it. Once and for all, Paul said. Once and for all, done. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father because it's over. It's done. He completed that task. Paul's trying to tell us here that there is a a holy revenge that comes against all the enemy and all of that influence in our times that, call, that we were choosing to be dis disobedient. And when we come into obedience, what happens is it establishes a whole new thing and we are raised up in a place that continually our life is smacking the enemy right in the face and saying, Jesus won, Jesus won, Jesus won, Jesus won. That's who we need to be. That's how we need to walk. Don't step back. And, and listen, even, even if you step in a hole, you still win. The enemy wants you to think if you step off the trail and fall down that you're done. And he's always quick to say, oh, you did it now. Oh, you're not coming back. Listen, don't believe that. That's a lie. Anything he says to you is a lie. He's a liar. He always has been. He always will be. Don't believe what he says. That's why Paul says you've got to take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And that's why he's trying to let you know that these weapons aren't literal weapons. Okay, so if you break that word down, the weapon, weapons of our warfare... Weapons can mean instrument, armor, tool, utensil. Paul is just in this, he's just tried to explain the weaponry because Roman soldiers were everywhere and they got that symbolism, right? But it's, it's even more than that. It's a utensil. The utensils of our warfare. The tools of our warfare. The instruments of our warfare. Okay, that says to me that it might not be a sword that's used at one time. It could be a pen. That it might not be a shield that's used at a moment, but it might be eating a meal with someone that doesn't know God. A utensil. We can be used in many ways and fashions, and God can use those pieces as weapons for Him. He can use writing to be a weapon for him. He can use singing to be a weapon for him. He can use serving to be a weapon for him. Are you hearing me? He can use sweeping a floor, changing a diaper as a weapon of warfare. Hello? It does take warfare to change diapers, by the way. Have you seen those videos where these poor dads who don't ever change diapers go in to do it? And it's like, oh, oh. I mean, they, it's like, I'm dying. I'm dying. I, you just hold your breath, man. Just some things you got to do. It's not all fun. <laughs> but with the understanding here about these, the weapons of our warfare, they're, they're, they're not literal weapons, but no matter what shape or design, it's used as something to arm ourselves with in warfare. That word warfare is uh, uh, strataia. It's one of the base words where we build our word strategy from. The weapons of our warfare, our strategies, our strataia. 
It means an expedition, a campaign, military service, opposition to the discharge of our duties as believers. Okay, think about this. The enemy opposes any of us functioning as believers, anything we do as a believer. The discharge of that function, he opposes. That's warfare. He's in opposition to anything that a believer should do. And what does it say we should do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. They're totally opposed to that. They want to stay right where they are. But just by being a believer, you can stand and see that, that dark thing disappear. And not because you're so strong, but because he's so strong. Actually, Paul is, is talking about his, uh, his apostolic career. He's talking about the fact that in his life, he's being opposed, that it's uh, got hardships, it's dangerous. I mean, he listed all the hardships and stuff that he went through. But the fact remains that if we are believers, we are, we are in an apostolic calling. A lot of people have made a big deal about apostles and prophets and all of the fivefold gifts, but there are far more than five gifts. God hasn't limited himself to five things. He is way beyond that. There are mixes and, and measures of different things and capacities of apostle prophets and pastor teachers. and I mean, there are probably numerous abilities to mingle those five but there's gifts of administration, there's gifts of service, there's gifts, I mean, it goes on and on. There's, and and if, that's just a few that he mentioned. And what was the scripture that says, you know, had we written all the stories about him that could have been written, it would, it, it wouldn't, it, it'd be too much to fill a book. If he's that amazing and awesome that we couldn't even fill it with the stories, can you imagine the gifts that might be being released that we don't even comprehend? The tools, that you, the utensils that are, are just sitting in the seats to be used for His glory, there's far more gifts than we realize. But that's, we're talking about warfare. And it's not carnal warfare, not bodily warfare, not temporal warfare of this realm not something in our flesh or under the control of our appetites. Not having its seed in human nature, the weapons of our warfare are not that. Not aroused by our nature or our body. N nothing equivalent to human. The weapons of our warfare are not that. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3, For you are yet carnal because you still have among you envying and strife and divisions. You're carnal and you still walk like men. He's talking to the Corinthian church here. Why is he saying that? Because he's saying they haven't pulled away from their flesh. They're still walking like men. He said, your destiny is not to walk like men. Your destiny is to walk like a person of the Spirit. To walk like Jesus. I love that. You're not supposed to look like and act like and walk like men, although you look like an, a, a man and a woman. <laughs> You're supposed to act like that spirit man that you are and act like you come from the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of glory and the kingdom of, of God rather than the kingdom of men. You must resemble your father. So when we look at the weapons that Paul is referring to in Ephesians 6, he's very clearly saying, these aren't normal weapons. I'm just giving you examples to help you relate to the strength and position of what you really must carry. So Paul lists the weapons in order here out of Ephesians 6. But I want to propose that the last things mentioned should probably move to the top of the list. If we pray in the Spirit first, and we stay in the Word. That's a one-two punch. It's extremely powerful. And the truth is, if this is what you've got, if that's all you got is that you pray in the Spirit and you got the Word of God, you can probably win a battle. Truthfully. If that's what you're going into battle with, you can win. 
You can win. Pray in the Spirit. Stay in the Word. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You've got to grab that. You've got to have that. That's very important. Jesus fought off the devil with the Word. He said, it is written. You don't see him, you know, saying all these things. Well, I'm putting up my shield of faith right now. You don't hear him saying, I'm putting my helmet on that says I'm saved because he is salvation. (laughs) Okay, listen, if he didn't have to do that, you don't have to say, got this helmet and I'm putting it on. I know I'm saved. Well, yeah, you do, but you, 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 you don't have to do that every time. All you have to do is say, the Lord rebuke you. My Jesus, I'm seated with him in heavenly places. I don't need to show you all the armor that you need to think you see on me. Those are just examples of what I am, and I am a creature and a, and a person of light. I've been created to carry the light of Jesus, and his spirit in me releases me from fear. So obviously the other things are important, right? But you need to know that, and let this be imparted to you, grafted into you, you are not weak. Not one of you. Not one of you is weak. Stop saying you're weak. Stop saying you need more. You're not weak. You do need more, but stop getting into that position of being victimized. The enemy wants you to think you don't have anything, and that's not true. You're not weak. You are not unable. You don't lack faith. I'm I'm pushing you a little. Here's why I'm saying that. Because you don't do this stuff on your own. Okay, let's look at the weapons for a second. The belt of truth. You can't get that yourself. Scripture says you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That word know means you will discover the truth, uncover the truth. How will you do that? By the Holy Spirit? By the Word of God? It's not like you can say, I'll figure out the truth here and put it on. No, you're, you can't do that. Holy Spirit has to help you to grasp it. You can't do it on your own. The Spirit of truth has to be imparted to you by the Spirit. So Lord, right now, we just declare that you by your Spirit are imparting truth to us. We can't grab it ourselves because somehow we always kind of mess it up. It, it happens. We're human. We, 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 we need your truth. We need you, Jesus, because you are the truth. Impart it to us by your Spirit. Okay, so the, breath, the breastplate of righteousness. That word righteousness can also be uh, holiness. You can't get that yourself. You can't, you can't be righteous by yourself. It says you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's why we put him on like a cloak. The Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's not you, it's him. It's him. Don't think that you're righteous or you can be that. It has to be his righteousness in you. I know I'm splitting hairs here just a little bit, but but please grab what I'm saying. We can be righteous. We can be full of truth, but it's not of our own doing. It's of his doing in us. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Why is that scripture even there? Because it's the truth. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Okay, follow my my train here. Okay, follow what I'm saying to you. 
You can't be righteous yourself, but you can follow him who is, and he can impart righteousness to you through Jesus. Leviticus 20, 26. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. In other words, God is doing the making of holiness. God is so holy that he showed the prophet a vision of angels that were singing solely of the holiness of the Lord. That's Isaiah 6, 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he was high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Whew. He had a vision of, of what was happening in heaven. And then he, he saw what was going on, and, and he said, woe is me, I'm undone. Why? Because he couldn't get there himself. An angel came and took a coal from the, from the altar and touched his lips. Woo, man, we've got to have intervention from heaven to help us even do the things that we do, to help us worship, to help us engage. To Listen, you don't get anybody saved. I don't care how good a talker you are. I, 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 honestly, I don't care what techniques you use, what books you've read. It's not you. It never has been. It never will be. Holy Spirit is the one that draws. Holy Spirit is the one that leads. I wouldn't be here today if Holy Spirit hadn't led me and somehow guided me into a place That's why David said in Psalm 51 and 10, create in me a clean heart. Okay, create in me a clean heart. He couldn't get his own heart clean. Are you grabbing that? You can't get yourself clean. Appeal to heaven. Create in me a clean heart. Help me to be clean. Help me to be holy. Make me holy, God. Assist me in, in becoming what you want me to be. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about God doing it in us. Leviticus 20 and 7 says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. Here's the key. Because I am the Lord who makes you holy. He's the one that makes us righteous. Okay, wow, we had to camp there for a minute, but that was really good. Okay, what about the helmet of salvation? You can't get that yourself. It doesn't, you, can, you can try all you want, but you can't make yourself safe. Jesus saves, and he alone. No man comes to the Father except through him. He saves no one, nothing else. John wrote this, and this is so powerful. We've heard it a hundred times. But God sent not the Son in, his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You have a helmet of salvation upon you. Why? Because someone died for you. Your Savior, your Jesus, your, your, your Messiah, He died so that you could be saved. You can't save yourself. The shoes of peace. Well, you can't get that yourself either. I know thousands, I, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of people that have tried to gain peace and they can't get it. Because it doesn't matter how you, how you go about it, how you try and live, how you try and function, you cannot bring the peace that goes beyond your understanding. You can't. Because peace is not a, a thing, it's a hymn. 
It's a person. You can't manufacture your own peace. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Him. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. Give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. That's John talking, and he's quoting Jesus saying, uh, Look, it, it's me. Let me read it in the NIV. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Whew. Philippians 4, 7 goes on and says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Another version says transcends all understanding. Will guard your hearts and your minds. What? In Christ Jesus. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you. The light of his face and the Lord will give you his shalom, his peace. He'll give you of himself. Nothing missing, nothing broken, all complete. That's, it's Jesus, our peace who has broken down every wall. He is our peace, who has broken down every wall. He is our peace. You can't make it. You can't get it yourself. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. You can't get it yourself. You just can't. People will tell you, oh, I have, I, I've got faith. I've, I, how did you get it? Unless you think that it can be gotten. See, that's the problem we fall into. People get judged all the time by other people who think they're not in faith. The truth is, you can't get it yourself. It says we, we're to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Yeah, but that's, that's because it has to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. It's the work of the Holy Spirit constantly functioning and moving to help us believe. You can't believe without Him. See, the prayers we need to be praying right now for people who don't know Him, they have a veil over, them, uh, over their understanding. They, 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 it's like they can't make the right choice because of that veil. So you know what we pray? We pray God remove the veil. Just like you tore the veil in two without hands, by your sacrifice on the cross, that thing was ripped from the top to the bottom, forever opening the way for people to come to him. If that was done then, it's still good right now. That means we can say, tear the veil, Lord. Open it up. Because Holy Spirit is constantly, constantly, constantly going, constantly trying to reach them, constantly trying to get in a crack or an opening. Anything that's there, God will use people that you don't even know who are hearing from Him. I, he, he works on so many levels. and so, It's, it's mind-boggling how much He loves mankind. And He wants no one to perish. Not one. That's why he gave his son and a piece of his piece of himself as the son of. Uh, That's why he did it. So that everyone can be saved. So we've just got to thank God that that's his purpose and his plan and that's what he wants. And so we're just going to come in alignment with his plan. We're just going to say, yeah, the veil is torn. Bring him in. That doesn't mean there's not going to be action on our part. That doesn't mean he's not going to say, I need you to like stir it up here. What, what did Paul say to Timothy? Stir up the gifts that are within you. Why? He was saying, you've kind of stepped back and gotten a little passive. Sometimes God has to say to us, yeah, stir it up. Holy Spirit, push them a little bit. When we begin to believe as Holy Spirit is... is nudging and pushing and urging, then he begins to build us up in faith. How many times did Jesus say to people, 
Oh, because you believed. I mean, they didn't have a grid. All they had to do was say, I believe you. I believe you can do it. They didn't even have faith yet, but because they believed, suddenly their faith was coming alive, and they began to realize, wait a second, I don't just believe. I have faith to believe that something is about to happen. We didn't just go in there kind of skipping around the other day at the hospital and say, oh, you know, I'm hoping everything's going to be all right. They went in because the Holy Spirit was stirring them and to, to do more than just believe, but to have faith in Him that He could do it. And He's doing it. Our faith grows. We begin to be built by the Spirit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Keep the Word in you so you can continue to be built and encouraged and strengthened. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. But that faith came through the belief that came by the Spirit so you could even have the ability to believe and have faith. And Paul says, And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one might boast. And then he says to the church in Rome, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of God, the glory of God. In other words, God is doing it. God is stirring it. God is building it. God is empowering it. In Luke 17, the apostles even said this, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> Why did they say that? Because they couldn't get it on their own. They needed him to help them. So, Father, right now, increase our faith. Your disciples asked for it. Stir us. Help us to believe by the Spirit. You know that sword of the Spirit? You can't get that yourself either. It's His Spirit in us. It's His Word in us. It's the Word that Holy Spirit uses that cuts the enemy to shreds, that divides and reveals the difference between truth and lies. It's the Holy Spirit. All right. So you see the weapons, the tools, the utensils, are not flesh and blood kind of things, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and now we're casting down those imaginations and those things that the enemy flits around in us, tries to get to land in us. Heard somebody say one time, they were talking about sin actually, but it's the same with, the enemy works the same. He said, it's not wrong for a, a, a bird to fly over your head and land on your head, but if you let him stay and build a nest, then you got a problem. We have to continually keep sweeping the enemy out of the way and not letting him get root or get a foothold so that then he can get a stronghold in our life. Because he wants us to be free and free indeed, and he wants us to function fully believing Him that He can do what He says, fully believing His Word and His truth, fully coming from not just belief now, but into faith, a greater faith. We can't do it. But remember, we, it, none of this is on our, by our own doing. We just have to say yes and say, Jesus, we need you. Increase our faith. Increase, help, us, help us to be all the things you're asking us to be. You have a plan for us. Now help us and set it in motion for us. We're saying yes. Use us. Do it. But you have to empower us and get us there by your Spirit. So, Father, right now, I just bless every person in the sound of my voice today, both online. We've got many that are, that are, are away today, and we just bless them today to receive from you in such a powerful way because you're as strong where they are as you are right here. And I thank you for releasing 
all of you and all of your presence and all of your power. We thank you, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. You're the same God that brought the commandments to Moses and came in fire for Elijah. You're the same. You're the same God. You haven't changed. And we thank you that by your spirit that you have released into this, this realm that we are living in, You've given us your Holy Spirit, and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're always pulling, you're always encouraging, you're always teaching, you're always leading. And we thank you that you are leading us into truth. You're leading us and, and, and encouraging us and helping us to be righteous and holy. You're giving us more faith than we could even imagine. You're building that in us. We thank you for it. You've, you're, you're enlightening your word and your truth so that the, the sword of the Spirit can just destroy the works of the enemy. For we're determined we are not going to step back. We, we're going to stand in peace because you are our peace. Every weapon, it's not carnal, but it's mighty through you to the pulling down of strongholds. So right now we cast down the imaginations of the enemy. We take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ and we declare we are moving forward in all that you have for us. We will be your tools, your vessels. We will be your utensils. We'll be your weapons, whatever you have in, for us to walk out and walk in. We say, yes, Lord. But knowing full well, that the weapons of our warfare are not about us and flesh, but about you and what you're releasing. Build it in us, Jesus. Build it in us. Amen. Amen. So the Lord will bless you. The Lord will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you. The light of his face and the Lord will give you his shalom, his peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken, all complete. And the authority of chaos is completely destroyed by his shalom peace. And the names of our God are upon you. Shalom, everybody. Thank you for everything and being here today. We, we bless you all. And if you're joining us online, thank you for, for connecting today. We bless you. Thank you for all that you've given.